Why did Jesus have to die? The question that's been raised for centuries. I know I, as a little kid, um, in my teen years, before I received Christ as my saviour, I remember watching um, Geoffrey Hunter in The King of Kings, the film about Jesus, and, and at the end, I'm getting a bit cross, saying, it's unfair what they're doing to him. And the thought crossed my mind, like, God, if, if, if it's really true, why don't you just beat up the Romans? Get off that cross and clean them all up, you know, sort of the old... And uh, not realising, of course, that I had no idea of why Jesus had to die. He says in, in John 10, 18, an interesting verse, he says, I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Wow. He's actually saying that it wasn't the Jews, it wasn't the Romans that orchestrated this. That he had a mission, he had a purpose, that his purpose was to die so that we could find new life through his death and resurrection. He didn't die a martyr's death. He came to earth with a clear purpose and that purpose was to die in my place and in your place so that we can be saved from the capital penalty of our sins. And the Old Testament teaches that, that God made us perfect, perfect, and we wrecked it. We went our own way. We shook our fist to, to God and, and uh, got alienated from him and perfection, heaven on earth, the Garden of Eden, that's the image of what God wanted. He didn't want sin and pain and evil and suffering and war and murder and rape and all that kind of stuff. He wanted heaven to be on earth. And that was to be when we're in a right relationship with him, we're in right relationships with one another. But we wrecked it. We went our own way. That's the Genesis story. And so God, in his righteous judgment, said, well, look, there are consequences to law-breaking. There are consequences to doing what's wrong. And uh, it was a capital offence. Uh, to willingly choose to go against God. But he loved human beings. He loved Adam and Eve. He loves all people. And he's never stopped loving. And his love found a way. The whole Old Testament points, it's actually a book about love. It's a whole pile of history and poetry and songs, but it's about love, God's love for you, God's love for our world. A love so amazing that he was prepared to empty heaven of, of his finest, his one and only Son, His perfect Son, Jesus. And the eternal Son in spirit form became Jesus of Nazareth. That's what we celebrate, the Christmas story, the incarnation. And He came and lived among us. And uh, flesh of flesh, forever, He will look like a 33-year-old Palestinian man, Jew. And that's the price that God had paid and He walked among us and lived among us and was tempted and understood suffering and pain and evil and he felt it and uh, he revealed to us what God was really like and I've read so much literature from other religions and I studied it for about four years at university other religions and there's a lot of good stuff in other religions they're not all evil it's human beings trying to discover the meaning of life well what's my purpose why am I here it's man reaching out to God and uh, one of the books I read by uh, Dr. Smith was called The Religions of Man. And that's precisely right. They're the religions of people seeking after God. But the Bible teaches us that God was actually reaching out to us when we were rejecting him. And uh, he knew that we could not find him unless he provided the way. And the only way was through bringing his son to pay the capital offence that was upon the whole of humanity. And he dies in our place. God, human being, he becomes a human being and he dies in our place so that God could righteously, the right way, forgive us, restore us, give us the gift of eternal life, that we could go to heaven, that the, the ultimate Eden, heaven and earth, and you read the book of Revelation, heaven and earth come together and it's a perfect Eden, no more pain, no more suffering, no more evil, no more rape, no more murder. And the only way that's possible for people to enter into 
that heavenly experience and have received the gift of eternal life is if their sins could be forgiven. And the only way our sins could be forgiven was by Jesus taking the penalty for our sins on the cross. And this is the amazing story. And when Yen shared her story, and she was a teenager uh, just a few years ago, and uh, I said to her this morning, I said, man, you remind me of me. I was like you. And uh, I was a wild kid. And uh, so she's just a few years in the faith. And then Peter and Karen Crouch. I've known them for 30 years. I mean, I still remember when they received Christ as their saviour. We were all young people then, Pete and Karen. Now we're a little bit older. And, uh, but the, the, what they shared 30 years on of the reality of Jesus Christ. This is a risen Christ. This is not a dead saviour. This is someone who rose from the dead who said, you know what, I can forgive you, I can change your heart, I can transform you, I can change your life, I can give you a better life. And not immune from suffering in this life because of we're in this world, but you can have peace and life and meaning and purpose and ultimately when the day comes where you have to die, you don't have to fear death, that you can come to my heaven and be safe and, and totally secure for eternity. And heaven to me is everything we have on earth except so much more real and without pain and suffering and evil. You don't just sit on a cloud playing a harp. That's a crazy medieval thing. It's real. It's another dimension outside of, it's right around us. There are angels in this room. There are demons outside this room because they're too scared to come in. But there are angels here. So the moment you die, and I've been with lots of people who have died, and, uh, and as they pass from, from this life to the next, it's like, and sometimes the room is filled with a presence and you think, what's happening here? Angels, the Holy Spirit, as they're ushered into heaven. But where is heaven? Past the moon? Past the sun? Past the Andromeda galaxy? No, it's all around us. And it's more real than what we have around us physically. Crazy for us to understand it, but that's what the scripture teaches. And it's real. And one day, Jesus is going to reconstitute this physical earth and heaven and earth will meet. And, uh, and so eternity we will be with Christ saved and secure so there is a an amazing scripture that actually foretold what was going to happen this is 700 years before the birth of Christ so having been a student of the Old Testament and initially it didn't make sense to me but when I came across some of these passages, like this one here, another one in Psalm 22, a whole stack of verses that talked about Jesus and his life. 700 years before Jesus was born, this is what the great prophet Isaiah said. He foretold the amazing salvation story that Yen and Peter and Karen shared. Listen to this, and you'll see a great exchange taking place. Jesus and us. He says, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain. Notice the ours here. He bore our suffering. We, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was bruised for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed we all like sheep have gone astray like our first parents in genesis each of us has turned to our own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all the penalty for all of our wrongdoing all the guilt all the shame all the fear after he has suffered he will see the light of life and be satisfied he looks at you and he's satisfied and says, yep. He looks at Yen and Peter and Karen and me and those of us that have received him and he says, you know what, I'm satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. He'll make them right with God and he will bear their iniquities. Wow, the great exchange is this. He was rejected so that we can be accepted by God. He was crushed so that we can be healed by God. He was separated from God so that we can be reunited with God. He was condemned by people and God so that we can be pardoned by God. Wow. 
powerful. Wonderful. Rejected so that we can be accepted. Crushed so that we can be healed. Separated so we can be reunited. Condemned so that we can be pardoned by God. Do you know what? You can, this Easter, this Good Friday, this very service, experience what so many of us have here. Not about getting religion and trying to become good. In fact, trying to become good and get re-educated doesn't work. It's not the good that gets saved. It's the bad. It's the people who say, you know what, I'm wrong. I've messed up. I've sinned. And my life is going astray. And Pete and Karen and Yen shared that so honestly and openly. It's the humble. Those who say, you know what, I don't have it together. Pride is, keeps us from God. Those who say, you know what, I'm wrong, but I know that God is right. I know that Jesus is real. And to pray the prayer, Jesus, if this is really you, if, if this is really true, I'm prepared to open my heart and open my life and give you a go. And I guarantee if you come with humility and faith, like the faith of a child, the simplicity and honesty and humility, and say, God, I don't have it all together. I know I've sinned. I've done some wrong things. I've done some bad things. And we've all done that. No one is perfect. Look at our Aussie cricketers. Man, your heart goes out to them. And I mean, I've written a few tweets. I say, they're just boys. They're stupid at times. They do dumb things. I was a boy. I was stupid and did some dumb things. Hey, where's mercy? And are so quick to judge and be harsh towards people if they're repentant, if they're saying, I'm really sorry. And I thought last night, Steve Smith just did it so well. I thought, boy, you know how to repent. I mean, it was cruel. It was hard. He's crying and he's offended his daddy and his mum and he's feeling... Oh, it's not a, you know, and, and I'm thinking, you know, that's, that's good. That's good for the soul. Pray for that boy that he will come to a place of wholeness because if you wallow in your sin and your guilt and fear and shame, you'll break down mentally. You'll wreck your relationships. And, and I think that uh, I hope that we can see, hey, restoration. And I pray they get saved. Yeah, including David Warner. Wouldn't it be good for him to get saved? The Rat Bag Incorporated. Get him saved to be a great evangelist for Jesus. God loves him. He loves them all. But to, to, to err is human. If you're quick to judge others and to point out their sin, it reveals pride to say, I'm above them. I'm a cut above them. No, you're not. Neither am I. But for the grace of God, there we all go. We need forgiveness. We need pardoning. We need salvation. And the only way you can receive it is by saying, Jesus, I'm wrong. You're right. If you're real, come into my life and change me. Look at this scripture. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Wow. Will you follow him from this day? You can say, Good Friday. 2018 was when I opened my life to Jesus and light came. And when light comes, life soon follows. When light comes, when you, when you are enlightened and you see not just a person of history dying on a cross, but you see him dying in your place for all your sins, that's light. That's the only way you can really understand the love of God. You can read the four Gospels and see how Jesus acted and reacted and you see the love of God displayed in his goodness, but there's nothing like the cross because he's dying for people who don't deserve it. He's dying for people who are not good. And even his murderers, he's forgiving. He doesn't agree with them. He doesn't say, this feels good, boys, keep it up. What they did was dastardly, the torture, the torment. But he forgave them just, and he found something in their favour. And, he, and he, he's kind of thinking about these people who are killing him. And all of us. And he found something in their favour. Ignorance. Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. And sometimes we're in that same position. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know who we are. We don't know 
why we do what we do and where we're going. And I think Yen, Peter and Karen explained to us that when Christ comes into our life and we experience forgiveness of our sins, guilt and fear and shame gets removed and he starts to unwind us. Karen shared that well. said so kind of like turning us around and all of us are being changed by him. He loves us too much not to keep changing us. And I'm, I've been in the faith for 47 years and uh, he's still changing me. You know why? Because none of us have arrived and we need him every day. And so that scripture, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in Colossians 1, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Wow. I'm going to invite you all, whether you're part of the Christian Family Centre or you're one of our guests here today, to come around the Lord's table. Because the communion service that he instituted, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Before I die, I'm going to take bread and wine and say, this is my body, this is my blood, because I want you to focus on the benefits of the cross, that it brings forgiveness. Because Christians can easily become religious and we become a bunch of do-gooders and moralizers and, and we can be so judgmental and harsh towards the world and we forget that we've been forgiven of our sins, our many sins. I'm reminded every day, but, but for the grace of God, there I go. That's why I can't condemn people. I have to love them and reach out to them, not agree with them. <laughs> Some things people do are terrible. But you, 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 I, I want to be like Jesus, to find the good. And, uh, and today he invites you. This is the Lord's table. This is not the table of the Christian Family Centre. This is not my table as the senior minister of the Christian Family Centre here to, to say, well, you've got to be part of our group, otherwise you don't take it. This is the Lord's table and he invites you to take it. If you're not a believer in him yet, but you're on the journey, you can take the emblems and just cry out in your heart and say, Jesus, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. Give me the light that I need. I need new life. If you want to pass, let the emblems pass you by, feel free to do that. But I want to invite you to be a part of this and to enter into talking with Jesus who's among us and do business with him and say, Lord, I want to thank you for who you are, what you've done for me and help me to live the life you want me to live and if you've never received him, to do it now. So let me lead you in a prayer before we move into this time of taking the emblems. Father, thank you for this beautiful service. And as we come to its finale, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, open hearts, open minds. Let your light flow. Let insight come and let new life come as people genuinely, by faith, step out and receive Christ as their Saviour and their Lord this Easter. We pray it in your name. Amen.